welcome to all of you. I'm Jeffrey G. O'Brien. I direct Lunch Poems um, along with Noah Warren. And we are really thrilled to have Mary Jo Bang with us today. We've been foiled twice, once by fire season and once by early pandemic. Are we in middle or late? Nobody knows. Um, but we are only semi-foiled today. We have a version of Mary Jo Bang with us and I'm really pleased about that. Mary Jo Bang, the poetry, so heterogeneous, um, which is amazing given that often this is a poet who works in coherent, discrete projects and yet also knows how to collect stray fugitive lyrics when it's necessary to do so. Across the many kinds of work that Mary Jo has produced, I feel like there are a bunch of abiding concerns, however. There are massive concerns and massive concerns that have always been proper to poetry, but Mary Jo Bang has made them hers. I'm thinking primarily about care for others, but not just simply as an intuition or a feeling, but as a, a commitment and a practice and something to historically trace. And linked to that, um, a fascination with, and of course an upset with, um, the susceptibility of things and persons to destruction. I think that Mary Jo is also particularly interested in how various of the arts attempt to negotiate the fact of time's erosive forces, and also the erosion and corrosion of historical forces on people and things. And I think she shares a little bit of um, the feeling that I and many other poets have also had, that poetry is somewhat more resistant to destruction than many of those sister arts because of its immateriality, although that's also a problem with it. Um, I think that those two interests converge in several forms of Mary Jo's, a, a, an interest in the elegy, a place where, of course, a tremendous care is being visited and revisited on the basis of the susceptibility of a person to destruction. Um, but I also think she's interested in the loss of women's work in art to history when it's undersold, um, suppressed. Um, she has a book called Louise in Love about the silent film actress Louise Brooks and her most recent um, a doll for throwing about Lucia Moholy, the Bauhaus photographer, many of whose photos were um, tactically misattributed to Walter Gropius, I think, and to her husband, Moholy Naj. Um, and that ardent feminism that I think is behind, within, and through um, these commitments of thinking about care and destruction show up in this book again and again. It's called A Doll for Throwing, um, which in German is Werftpuppe, and describes like a flexible doll that if you throw um, can land gracefully and without damage, um, regardless of, I guess, how hard you hurl it and, and where you throw it and how it lands. Um, I think it's a good figure for poetry um, and a good figure for how we're tossed about by all those pressures upon us. Um, that make us selves and also make us something other than just what those pressures might want to predict for persons. I just wanna read one moment from one of the poems in A Doll for Throwing. It's from a poem called Our Game, Our Party, Our Work, where I think you can hear the convergence of these kinds of concerns. Um, some say a war ends only when it becomes smoke rising from a book in a library destroyed by fire. And yet that fire sparks another that library moves to another city and then to another. And so war, not once, but over and over. And everywhere, there are those who care and those who don't. Um, it's constantly moving, care and carelessness, fire, war, and poetry, um, library to library, and to Mary Jo. Please join me in welcoming Mary Jo Bang. Thank you, Jeffrey G. Um, O'Brien, and thanks to Noah Warren for inviting me over and over again. Um, and I'm so happy to finally be here. And thanks also to Elena, who um, orchestrates the technological uh, aspects of this reading. So I thought I'd begin by reading some poems from this book that Jeffrey mentioned, Adol for Throwing. Um, the project the book arose out of my obsession with um, Lucha Maholi, uh, the Bajas photographer, whose name I had never encountered until I saw a small photograph of hers. And 
saw that her name, um, the name of the photographer was Lucha Maholi. And um, I did know someone named Laszlo Maholi Naj, who was a Bauhaus master uh, teacher and a um, very talented um, artist, photographer, painter. So I wondered if they were related. And in fact, they were. She was his first wife and she went with him to the Bauhaus. And on that occasion, um, Walter Gropius asked her because she had experience in darkroom and photography, if she would photograph all of the objects that came out of the workshops and the buildings that they built in Dessau. And she did. And those photographs are the way we have received the Bauhaus. Uh, almost all of those that you'll see anywhere um, were taken by her. But there's a long story about what happened after that. And um, that's what began to become an obsession for me. So um, I'll just start by reading and I'll talk a little bit more along the way. So many of these um, are based on Bauhaus photographs, many of these poems, but this one, Self-Portrait with Others, is an imagined self-portrait. Before I moved out, there were five of us, me, my sister, my mother, my brother, and the man who modeled what we were all to think. He said, we are nature, like it or not, sun, clouds, rain, and reeds like those monks used to show their humility back in the Middle Ages. I wonder whether humility gets in the way of ambition. I wanted to travel. The morning my mother said I mustn't, I wanted to stop her mouth and shake her. It felt like taking a step. And um, this is a, a photograph of what it says in the title, the chess set on a table between two chairs. I wanted to be my father, leave, return, leave again, saying nothing to no one. My mother, a musician, an orchestra of self-absorption. My brother, a filmmaker who says he wants to reinvent himself. He thinks an American name will make a new man of him as if a pill dissolved sublingually can make the mouth speak in a manner the mind never knew. We are in a cafe. The mosaic ceiling above us is a blue overturned bowl full of goldfish. Each open mouth is a blind spot. Want, want, want. I catch sight of myself in a mirror. The speaker of these poems, um, is the um, best conceived as um, Dickinson says, a supposed person. Um, and um, that supposed person is a um, construct that uses some of the details of Lucha Maholi's life, some of the photographs by uh, many other women in the Bauhaus who were also um, kind of overlooked um, in the histories until quite recently. The mirror. My hair is held back by a barrette. The tree in the background is green. Out of sight, birds talking on the right. To the far left, and almost too far off to be heard, a dialogue between two men. I wish I could break in, too, and be formless, one half listening in, one half thinking about nothing but the fact that the nape of my neck is too warm. The express train flashes past, followed by a crashing silence. I've rejected the milk mild smile. It's married to the risk of fossilization. Granite with blood in its veins is still granite. On the bark of the pine behind me, a single cicada is glittering. That world is an island where it is always morning and the cool breeze is always invigorating. You can tell by my hair how it's blown back. You can tell by the light, it's there and not going anywhere. There is no moment that isn't all spectacle. The theatrical silence is the sun. The gray stage is winter. The circle is pure dilatation. The shock mouth of me looking back at an avalanche of broken glass. So 
after um, Holy Naj and Lucha left the Bauhaus, they moved to Berlin and um, she taught photography at a school and um, she, the, the couple broke up, um, split up, and she became involved with somebody who was in the Communist Party and who had been elected to the Reichstag. Um, and in 1933, when Hitler became chancellor, he began to arrest all the communists and put them in prison. And um, it was in her apartment that Theodor Neubauer, her lover, was arrested and taken away by the Gestapo. So that very day, she had to take only what she could carry, leaving behind 500 glass negatives and um, go on a train to um, first she went to back to Prague, probably to get funds from her family. And then she went to Paris. And finally she uh, located in London where she um, set up a, a portrait studio. And she also wrote the first lay book um, on photography, a hundred years of photography. Admission. My mother was glamorous in a way I knew I never would be. Velvet belt buckle, mascara lash, miniature crimson lipstick alive in the pocket of a purse. Her bow mouth was forever being twinned to a tissue. I never would wear that black window pane see-through blouse, mother of pearl buttons tracing the path down her spine. Every woman was her rival. You could say serious, seriousness made me impossible exactly the same way beauty made her. I understand men. Some like to have one woman in their arms while a second one stands on a half shell, both continuously shifting between being and being seen. Even as a child, I understood there were erotic fish hooks that one couldn't see. I learned to use a camera to see what I could be. In this photograph, I am untitled and seen through the way a wine glass placed on a table transparently suggests wine will be served. I don't mean to say that is all that I am, but it is a fact that even in the dark, angles often conduct the eye into a lighted interior. There, someone sees and says to herself, I wasn't always this way. One sometimes becomes. This photograph is um, by Lottie Jacoby. It was taken in 1929. Um, it's called Ahead of a Dancer. And the dancer is a Russian uh, woman, Nyura Norskaya. And um, it's her face, which is um, very small and um, a huge black hat. And that fills the frame, the head of a dancer. The days when you lean your head forward, then pull your head back to see the sun is only a chrysanthemum. The eye is a white lake with a black boat moored at a particle pier that says what you want back isn't coming. The white speck says there's a light source that shines day and night far from a balcony on which an audience waits to see us open our doll eyes and close them again. I keep my face facing front to see every last thing that is coming. What is coming is this, a hat to be worn when taking a train, a compact in a pocket, a letter in a pocket, two hands, a waterfall pouring its contents into a well-worn shuddering mind. I'm as devoted to knowing as the dim fish swimming in an ever widening circle. 
Today outraced the latest hour of midnight. My hat tells you that, that and that I strangely resemble you. Eyes, nose, lips that refuse to open, knowing the face is glass and that glass can make or break you. The dog in the street pauses just as a car comes. Where does it stop? And now this, someone says. The precise line draws the bone that holds the cheek in place. The cheek waits to be kissed by air as it was once kissed by the dark haired boy in the boathouse whose late night lesson was that the distance between what had been described and what was now happening was immeasurable. The morning after the black shoes on the shelf were married to a new all encompassing idea. The dress is no longer the thing the future is founded on. You put it on, you take it off. In terms of the constructive persona, um, this photograph contains a lot of um, obviously things that were suggested by the photograph. The, the um, hat made me think of a fishbowl and that's where the dim fish um, swimming in an ever widening circle came. But the boathouse was actually um, two places. One, I was in Berlin. I was so obsessed that I um, applied for and was given a um, fellowship at the American Academy uh, in Berlin and so that I could spend time in the Bauhaus looking at Lucia Maholi's photographs and the photographs of the other women of the Bauhaus and reading her letters and her diary of her age 14, um, putting it into Google Translate because it was in Czech. Um, but it was also, um, so I was walking by a boathouse in Wannsee, which is where I was staying. But there's also a boathouse in Ferguson, Missouri, where I grew up um, in the January Park. And so the uh, two boathouses um, became conflated then and now. And um, I feel like that's behind this book is that then is now, and now is then, or will be then. So the kind of fluidity of time and um, in some ways, the things that don't change, trying to you know, get credit for your work, um, trying to be a woman in the world. And this is a collage photograph, uh, photograph. Me, a chronicle. Shapes that begin as just one solution to a common problem can go on to become an inflexible method. Take, for example, houses. Once a certain way of arranging walls takes hold, it's difficult to imagine any other. Another example might be locomotion, the method and circular means of moving from one place to another. I was drawn early to the idea of other modes of seeing, especially to photography. Looking back, I see myself entering the living room. I see my father crossing the room to open or close a window. My mother's zigzags pattern of static. My sister, the new century's picture perfect child. My brother, the new century's self-possessed man. At one point, the idea of rebellion became a unified belief. I left. Can you imagine the impact? Who hasn't felt that in order to breathe, she has to splinter the first self and leave it behind. I constructed a second self. I photographed myself as if I were a building. We have to be uncompromising. You have to be uncompromising as you pass through. Although it sometimes seems random, the gawking on the street is not imagined. I see the barriers. They are there by design. Every image of a woman speaks of a theatrical body performing a script, the connector that shoulders when there's a war and embroiders when it, there isn't. I can see that they, meaning we, are meant to be objects, small scale, fragile, unassuming, 
many men see themselves as having obvious affinities with other famous men, not only from the same period, that would be banal, but from every period since time began, even Adam, even Eve. They see themselves as being more fascinating lying on a bed than the body lying beside them. She is an everyday animal of ubiquitous fabric sewn together with blue and red thread, a certain system that can act as a cushion at night when things are hard. Make no mistake, she is also, when things work well, an almost fully realized artwork, repaying the viewer with attention. Sometimes reading these poems, I feel like I have to say like, um, if you remember the show Seinfeld and um, there's this great scene where Elaine is on the subway and she's going to a, um, I forget if it's a wedding or a baby shower, probably a wedding of two lesbians. And um, when she tells, somebody asks her where she's going and she says, and she says, but I don't hate men. Um, I feel like some of these um, feminist poems give that um, impression, but um, the rest of the story of what happened to Lucha's um, photographs was that um, she entrusted them to Laszlo Maholi Naj to keep. And um, he in turn gave them to Walter Gropius. And Laszlo Maholi Naj went to Chicago. He immigrated to Chicago and set up a, a school there. And um, Gropius went to Harvard and he began to teach there and also to publish and to um, have monographs about the Bauhaus school. And Lucha, meanwhile, was trying to get um, Theodore Neubauer out of prison, Brandenburg prison. Um, and she kept writing to Gropius. And, and she was also, as I said, taking photographs. And, and she was being asked to give lectures on uh, photography and on the Bauhaus. And, um, but she had no slides to show. And so she wrote, and I saw those letters in the Bauhaus archives asking Gropius um, if he knew anything about where her negatives were. And he would ignore the question and simply say things like, well, can't you copy old magazines? And of course the resolution on something like that would be useless. Um, so it was only after the war when she began to see these monographs of the photographs of the Bauhaus work and, um, and her photographs, which were not attributed to her. So she wrote to Gropius and said, I have begun to see, um, you know, representations of my negatives. And it makes me think that maybe some of them survived the war. And, um, you know, do you have any idea where those might be? And he wrote back and he said, well, you'll be very happy to know, Alucha, that uh, I have them all and I've kept them very safe. And she was a bit appalled and wrote back and asked if he would please send them. And he said, no, I need them. And then another letter said, um, when she resisted, um, said, no, Ilsa remembers you gave them to us. Um, and of course she hadn't. Oh, he said, you gave them to us when you chose to leave um, Berlin. And she writes back and said, no one chose to leave Berlin. You know the circumstances under which we all left. And, um, and she was Jewish. And so of course, after Neubauer was arrested in her apartment, she had to flee. Um, this went on, she got a lawyer and this went on for years and um, Gropius resisted returning the negatives and finally he sent her about 60 of them, badly packed COD to her in London and that was what was left. So um, the kind of, um, I think what I'm channeling here are those many uh, situations in which women are undermined or silenced um, and um, how difficult it is then to establish the work that you did. So um, I'm gonna read some new poems now. 
And um, I realized that um, the first one I'm going to read is clearly in dialogue with um, the last one I just read. Now, this um, poem is called Here We All Are with Daphne. And of course, Daphne's from Greek myth. And Apollo is pursuing her. Um, he wants to um, have sex with her. And she is not interested. She has already vowed never to marry and never to be with a man. And um, one day she's out in the forest and there's Apollo and he starts chasing her. And uh, he's very close to catching her. And she calls out to her father, who's the river god, and says, please save me. And he does by turning her into a tree. Now, when looking back on that, I'm not sure that's the perfect solution to um, her situation. But even so, um, I guess the being a tree uh, embodies her uh, rigidity about her notions. Here we all are with Daphne. Here we all are at the waterfall, aligned and fixed like the stars overhead, that limited canopy under which the laughter of a cosmic joke echoes out into space. I'm one of the many waiting for the billow to be like it is on the sea, full-bodied, beautiful, a more than adequate distraction from the war that gets fought inside. We are all dying, but some more than most, so says my interiority. It talks to me as green fills the screen. It takes my arm and walks alongside me. I never ask where I'm going. I know I'm not meant to arrive. Me in my nice clothes, cut work, dress, blindfold of bark from the moment a man turned me into a tree. See, he said, isn't this all for the better? You with no mouth to speak of? By you, he meant me. I've become very interested in uh, the color green lately. It means so many things and um, has changed in poetry and um, in, um, in usage over time. And I was rather charmed to find out that green sleeves, of course, which is the name of uh, a hymn, uh, a Christmas carol hymn, um, was actually um, slang for prostitutes because they would roll around in the grass and get the, their elbows and the backs of their sleeves uh, would be stained with the grass. Green earth, the crush beneath your feet, green grass, the neon locator, your eyes close, you shake your head and think, the sea was once everything we needed. Bowie singing, do you like girls or boys? Bowie saying, I'll finance the film version in which I play everybody. The siren gets twinned in the violence of a long scene that refuses to end. This is the world is a statement. So is a day will meet the splintered ends of what went before it. The inhumanity, the rottenness, night rolls in to stand watch, to see if we find our way. This on a rock moving through air a century ticking away. The title of this next poem uh, comes from Gerard Manley Hopkins from his poem, Spelt from Sybil's Leaves, which might be my favorite poem in the entire world. Our evening is over us. It's the trading in of the workday categories Hours, clouds that linger inside plate glass corner windows, a man's head blocking the view, to begin to become instead a faint future caption at the bottom of a photo of hibiscus. There is no getting around the fact that each of us is a world of our own, an entity, a pageant of one. Just like you, I feel my way forward, letting the back of my hand brush the matte wall while I watch the chiaroscuro movie of my mind. There should be no anxiety in knowing the world will die when we die. 
This is how it is with us. The real is wherever we are. The days refuse to stay put. Speaking is a way of living with the ruin we were given. And I'll read two more poems. This one is called, How Will It Feel Months From Now? Um, I wrote this at the beginning of the pandemic when I realized that everything seemed like a steady state, but that meant that I began to notice those few things that did change. Um, for instance, uh, the sky. So how will it feel months from now? When the pink sliver of sky swims in through the window and you hear the high notes from the opera singer one story below, angel of wishing, angel of fortune, the cart overturned, the small animals from the back of the truck flooding the highway. The keys keep making the piano be. I have only ever wanted the red sky to turn blue. It's so beautiful when it sinks in. Hold me, closeness says. As long as I have sight, I'll see. The walls of time dissolve whenever the lights are turned off. The lights that made the day so easy to be with. I fold myself away. No mirage of sirens hammering the glass front of the hospital down the block. Stars guide the eye across the sky. It will be like that again and again. And this will be the last poem. Um, it, was, it was published on the Academy website. Um, in a section called uh, shelter in place. And you had to, um, or you were invited to write a few sentences about the poem. So I'll, um, I'll read you what I wrote. Um, Poor Hamlet, from our point of view, he's forever stuck on a stage, trying to decide whether to give up or to resolve like the unnamed speaker in Beckett's The Unnameable. I can't go on, I'll go on. I thought about how, in spite of all of Hamlet's angst and indecisiveness, he's still with us, standing in for that part of us that feels trapped in whatever we can't fix. I decided to free him for a few seconds and give him something hopeful to say. And this is the poem. Speaking of the future, Hamlet is saying, someday this day will be over. A moon will presumably still be above a bone quiet and inflatable in the scene, the cool blue swimming pool it finds itself in. And I will want to be. My mother, the queen, will want only my father, the king. All will be want and get, and I will be me. And oh, oh, Ophelia will be the essence of love, the love of a sister or the love of the brother, compassion, forgiveness, all will be want and get. We will all be together on stage and in dress, reciting our lines. What a fine day. What a wonderful way to be. No sirens, 50 stars, a cloud, a drawing of an all night sky. We'll be there, you as you and I. Thank you so much for coming to California. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. Um, I just, you know, want to linger with these poems of great beauty. Um, these poems gusted through by the angel of history um, and of, of startling precision and really staggering range. Thank you for bringing, uh, you know, such, such amazing work to us. Um, and I want to thank two, my name is Noah Warren. Hi, I work with Jeffrey on the series. Um, I want to thank two, the library for, as always, their generous support. I want to thank our AV, our AV, team, our AV team, who has uh, always, always provided such a uh, clean and masterful experience for us as for you all. And I want to thank you uh, for attending yet again uh, in this penultimate Lunch Poems uh, of the season. If you wanna review this reading as any other reading, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, um, which you can do by just searching Lunch Poems. I also encourage you 
to go to our website if you care to sign up for our mailing list um, or to get more details on forthcoming events. The website is lunchpoems.berkeley.edu. Um, our last invited reader of the season will be Shane McRae uh, on April 1st, April Fool's Day, and we hope you'll join us again then. So thank you for coming, and now the walls of time dissolve. <laughs>